Hey everybody, welcome to IIT 1501 Intermediate Electrical Controls. This is the second class of motor controls and we're building off of AIT 1401 which is basic electrical control. So uh, all the things that we have talked about and learned in 1401 we're now going to continue to build on. I believe I told you that from the very beginning of that class that this stuff doesn't go away we just continue to build on it. Uh, it's going to get a little more complex, so if there are any issues that you're having trouble getting your head around, uh, by all means come see me. Let's work it out and see if we can't uh, help you make heads or tails of it, okay? Because again, it's not going to get any easier as we go forward. Uh, going to get a lot more interesting, a lot more fun. The labs are going to be better too, so uh, you're going to get your uh, hands in a lot more stuff. I think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, the first lesson that we're going to uh, have in AIT 1501, we've sort of talked about already in 1401, and we have been doing a little bit of troubleshooting, okay? Um, just a little bit infused in a couple of, the class, or a couple of lessons in AIT 1401, um, but now we're going to do a little bit more full-fledged uh, lesson strictly on troubleshooting. Um, to be honest with you, it's a little more difficult for me to uh, convey the troubleshooting uh, aspects on, you know, online with the video lecture and everything and even in person what's going to take is you getting your hands on the meters and the amp clamps and everything that we're going to use for tools and working with the trainers okay and speaking of trainers we're going to have uh, some some uh, computer interface with the with the trainers it's going to set up some faults you're going to go find them in the circuits and things like that but we're not going to spend a tremendous amount of time on that I want you to learn the concepts of troubleshooting the basics and kind of get a feel and get comfortable with troubleshooting and how to go about the methodical process, where to go when you get stumped, and things like that. Uh, but we're going to spend as little time as possible on those Amatrol trainers. Um, I'm going to have you working with the uh, final project uh, trainer that you worked with in AIT 1401. I'm going to have you work with that, and you're going to get some real world troubleshooting, okay? You're going to have a schematic. Uh, some of you got some uh, experience with the troubleshooting uh, in, in the final project because uh, I think everybody that wired the project up had one issue or one or two, three issues, something like that. So we kind of had to start digging a little bit and figuring out what went wrong, okay? So you already did a little bit of troubleshooting, but we're going to be a little bit more uh, methodical in our approach uh, this time, okay? So we're going to get started. So the first lesson here is on troubleshooting, okay? So biggest question is, where do you start? When you're doing electrical troubleshooting, you walk up to a panel, uh, or a machine that's got you know, a panel that's got a ton of wires and a ton of relays, um, timers and counters and all kinds of different stuff in there. Um, but and you got machines that have machines that have uh, limit switches, and push buttons, and all these things going on. So where do you start? Because it can be overwhelming, and you got a print that may be eight, ten, twelve pages long. Okay, so where do you start? Well, you start with your best source of information, and that's these folks right here. Okay. These are your machine operators. These are the ones that you're going to encounter the first thing when someone calls you over to a system or to a machine that says, hey, I've got a problem, it's not working, okay? So this is going to, these are going to be your best friends, okay? And they're your best source of information. I know because I've, I've worked on the floor for many years and I need to really develop good uh, relationships with your operators, okay? I've got three rules for interacting with the operators. Number one, develop a positive relationship with that operator. It's critical. Uh, this is not just some thing I'm pulling out of a book or something like that. These folks are your best source of information, okay? No one knows this machine or this equipment like the person that spends 12 and uh, 16 hours a day with it. They know how it's supposed to operate. They know how it sounds. They know when it's acting up. They know when if it vibrates or starts doing something wrong that it shouldn't do. They're the first ones to know it. They're attuned and uh, keenly adapt to uh, knowing what's going on with that machine. They may not have technical knowledge to fix it or know the proper methods to use to get it up and running, but they have a tremendous amount of information, okay? Third one's probably the most important. Check your ego, okay? You may have gone to college and you may have your AIT degree or some other technical degree, and you may have some, a lot of experience. And maybe they're just uh, regular machine operators, don't know as much as you technically. But I'm telling you right now, they can mess with you and make you have a really bad day. So the best thing, the best advice I can give you, uh, and, and a lot of you guys that are working in the field right now already know this, check your ego. It's got no place on the shop floor, all right? They're gonna help you or they can turn around and do just the opposite and make your life miserable, okay? So uh, they either won't give you information 
or they may even sabotage the machine. It happens. Uh, they will play games with you and they will make you feel pretty stupid after a while, okay? So your best thing to do is develop that relationship with them, respect and protect the expertise that they have on the, the equipment as operators, and leave your ego at the door because uh, it's not going to help you at all, okay? All right, so there are two levels of troubleshooting that we're going to discuss today. First of all, we're going to talk about the 10,000 foot view first. It's the system level, okay? That is finding the component that's failed in the system that's giving you the problems, okay? Uh, when you first go up and approach the machine, uh, you're not going to start trying to look for components that you feel like are bad, okay? First thing you need to back up. I mean, like I said, take a 10,000 foot view and get a holistic approach. Again, pull that operator in there and have him help you uh, give as much information as he can, he or she can, okay? But you're looking for a component that's failed in the system that's, that's causing it not to work anymore, all right? Then the second uh, way of troubleshooting is the component level, okay? This is rarely done anymore, okay? In my component level, what I'm talking about is once we've found that component, we're going to fix it, okay? Chances are you're not going to do that. You're going to wind up removing it and replacing it with another, okay? It's cheaper to replace the component most of the time, okay? There are some cases where there's some very expensive components um, that, uh, are, that are, the repairs can be done in-house. It's more uh, economically feasible to do it that way. But for the most part, and you'll see a lot of this with printed circuit boards and, and things like that inside machines, uh, it's best to throw them out. You're not going to be doing that component level repair where you unsolder a resistor on a printed circuit board or a capacitor or something like that. All right, you take that board and either you throw it away or you have your uh, system, your company send it back for repairs to an authorized uh, repair service center or something like that. That's not what you're there to do. You just get, get the machine up and running, okay? So sometimes it's a lot cheaper to, uh, to just chuck it and replace the whole thing, okay? Uh, component level repair, again, is done by uh, manufacturer uh, authorized uh, repair facilities. Okay, another thing about component level uh, repair is downtime is expensive. It's very expensive. Okay, so they don't want you spending a lot of time uh, just trying to figure out what's wrong internal to a component or something like that. For example, if you had a control relay, they don't want you taking the control relay apart and replacing the coil or or set of contacts, most of the time it's going to be chucked the control relay, get it wired back in there, get my machine going, okay? And here's why, okay? you got to ask yourself this question. What's your company in the business for? And I use this as an example. I worked for a plant one time, uh, and uh, for example, we made aluminum, uh, uh, you know, primary metal. And uh, we had a lot of our engineering staff tied up with machine building, okay? And of course, the new plant manager came in and asked a very good question. What are we in business for? Are we supposed to be making aluminum or are we in the machine building business? There are a ton of vendors uh, out there that are, that are machine builders. That's what they do. That's how they make their living and they're there to support you. Okay? So keep, your, keep that question in mind. Are you in there to repair control relays or motor starters or things like that? Are you there to help keep the process going, the equipment running so that they can make their end product, whatever, whatever that may be? Okay? So you need to ask yourself what you're in the business, what they're in the business for. You need to support that goal, okay? And the resources should be centered around making the product or providing that service. So if you do that, you're going to be a lot better off, okay? And every company's policy is a little bit different, but you're going to uh, you find that most of them are not there for you to, uh, you know, do things on the, uh, you know, like I said, contacts on the motor starter or, or control relay coils or things like that, okay? Remove, replace, get that machine back up because that machine makes money and that's what they're in the business for, okay? All right, and you leave the rest of that stuff to the vendors and uh, or, or the manufacturers, okay? A couple of rules for, for troubleshooting, okay? Number one, keep it basic, all right? Uh, find out what's going on and just focus on what it is that's not working and keep it basic, keep it focused, okay? All right, the voltage in electrical troubleshooting, the voltage gone is, typically has gone missing. Okay, you got to find out where it went. Okay, particularly in control circuits and also in motor circuits as well. Okay, so um, stay away from these wild harebrained theories that a lot of people will come up. I've, I worked with a gentleman one time, and um, I think I think most of the time he tried to uh, to snow everybody, but uh, we were working on a simple problem, uh, and he tried to make it sound a lot worse than it is. It was intermittent, and he wanted to jump into ground loops and hysteresis and things like that. Now, that, that, 
you know, this, this kind of stuff just doesn't pop up. It's, it's running, running along fine, all of a sudden it starts to happen. Keep it, but he had a tendency to keep, to, to make things way more difficult than it had to be, and also get off, go down these rabbit trails, okay? So I call it stratospheric theory. Uh, stay away from those, okay? Keep it basic, keep it simple. Use the knowledge and the tools that you've gotten in these classes, and also in your job, on the job experience, and put those to work and make them work for you, okay? And here's a simple way of doing this, it's a good way to do it. Use four of your five basic senses, okay? Your sense of smell. You walk up to something, you smell something burning, you can probably get pretty close to, to the source of the problem right there without, it doesn't require meters and, and uh, testing and things like that. You can smell when something is burned, particularly electrical, okay? Uh, use the sense of touch, being very, very careful, mind you, okay? You, you can tell if something's vibrating or, or if something's gotten too warm. For example, an electric motor, if it's gotten too hot, Okay, if it's vibrating or something like that, you can, if, you're, if it's safe, and I'm going to reemphasize this, as long as it's safe, put your hands on there and see, is it, does it feel abnormal to you, okay? Vision, a huge thing, okay? Just look around and see what's going on with the machine. Uh, are cylinders stroking like they should? Um, are, are, are motors hopping up and down on their frame? Uh, so just different things like that. Use your vision, and that's kind of like common sense as well, too. And also listen to hearing. Um, your operators will be a good set of ears, eyes and ears for you as well. So listen for, for things like you know, squalling belts, uh, uh, loud, loud bearings and things like that, rotor rub and electric motor. Um, also uh, we'll talk about as we get in control relay or the control circuits, you'll hear relays popping in and out. Are you hearing that kind of thing? Okay. So again, four or five senses. The one I've left out is the sense of taste. I have yet to find a reason. Uh, to uh, to actually use your sense of taste. However, I'm going to post a video of um, a guy that did use his sense of taste for electrical testing. It's pretty comical and kind of sad at the same time, but um, look for it on Blackboard. It's going to be on there, okay? So anyway, let's talk about the tools that you're going to use when you are doing electrical troubleshooting. You've used these already uh, for the most part in AIT 1001, 1002, 1101, all your basic uh, electrical classes, okay? And that's the digital multimeter, okay? Um, the dis digital multimeter checks for AC and DC voltage. You already know that. You've done it a hundred times uh, with the other trainers, okay, and the other classes. Um, you can check this, check imbalances uh, of incoming voltages, okay? And by that, what I'm talking about is uh, you've got, so let's say you've got three phase 480, okay? Um, that's not one of the first things you want to check for. It's not a not a voltage imbalance. That's something system a systemic that's further up the up the food chain there. Uh, but if you if you're having difficulty that you can't quite figure out what's going on, particularly in the three phase section, you'll want to check for voltage imbalances. And, and the digital multimeter is an excellent tool to do that. Okay. So not only will you check the AC uh, incoming voltage or DC. Uh, you can also check to see, is it relatively close? I think uh, you're wanting within 10 to 15%. So if you've got 480 volts, you want, you're wanting within about 48 volts high or low. That side, it sounds a little extreme, but you really, uh, other, other things will draw off those phases and cause them to have some imbalances. But that's a, a, you use the digital multimeter for that. Um, and you're always going to be using this to check from your potential to, to a neutral source, okay? All right, so, and particularly in the control circuit. But that's, that's the digital multimeter. Again, you've used it a lot. And when I'm talking about potential, checking the potential, all right, what we're looking at here is this is, you should be pretty familiar with this, uh, with this drawing. This is your final project drawing uh, for 1401. You're looking for uh, what should be the potential voltage of, of 120 volts, and you reference it to neutral, okay? Uh, the 120 volts is coming out of the secondary of the transformer. We're assuming that the push button number one is pushed, and I'm going to, I should measure 120 volts when I'm referencing it to uh, neutral, okay? Now, I did see a couple of you, uh, when, when we ran into some problems, one of the first things that you did was you grabbed a meter and you put, we had power on it, and you immediately went to, uh, a couple of you went to ohms, which you should never do with power, you should, you should already know that, but a couple of you were checking voltage, and you're checking voltage across the normally closed uh, push button switch, the e-stop, okay? Well, the problem with that is you don't have a path back to neutral, okay? Because you've got an open, in your circuit right there. So what you should have done, uh, in which I talked to some of you through this, is put your lead right here, and then you want to put the other one here to reference it. So you, when you're referencing your potential, you're 120 volts to its neutral, okay? The potential is the difference there. The difference in potential uh, is between 120 volts right here and neutral, okay? And then, uh, so as you can see, 
if you put it right here, there's no path back to neutral, so you're really not going to measure anything. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying when I'm talking about uh, checking the potential um, to neutral. Okay. So the next thing, uh, one of the other tools that you'll use, we don't use these in labs so much, but it's a, it's called a wiggy. Okay. Um, and uh, I've, I've used these extensively in some plants that I've worked in. I really like them. Um, they're very quick. Uh, this is a this one is a Sperry. This is a Knopf K N O P P. I believe it is an outstanding wig. It's about 150 bucks, but it's it, it fits in the palm of your hand really well. Um, it's got a, it's uh, it, it it's got a good uh, readout on it and everything. This is a this is a Sperry. Um, and we've, we've only got one of these in the lab, but I'm trying to get you to use your meter so much that we really don't use these in the lab. But you use them just like a voltmeter, um, and you can take your lead and take it out, and you can um, you can just measure it. For example, just like the voltmeter, it acts just like the voltmeter. All right, you can measure your potential just like this. Okay, and what this does is it's got an inductive coil in there, and uh, when you put the voltage to it, it supplies voltage to that coil, and if it's on AC, it'll vibrate in your hand, and it will pull a little uh, dial down. It's like a flat dash mark, and it will pull, i try to get a little bit closer here. It'll pull a flat dash mark to the 120 or the 240 or 480, 600, whatever volts you're measuring. The more voltage, the, uh, the harder the, the um, coil pulls the um, armature into the magnetic field, and it, it's got a spring that resists it, so the more voltage it comes further down and makes a better reading for you, or, or a higher reading, I should say. Um, like I said, I like these. Um, you can use these, you can feel them vibrate in your hand, and they're just a quick, quick check on if you got voltage, okay? Now, um, this uh, it checks for AC and DC. Uh, when you are checking AC, you'll feel it vibrate. Why is that? Because we've got our sine wave going positive, negative, positive, negative 60 times a second, so it's creating that that pulsing is creating that vibration in there, okay? Just like a coil on a, on a uh, control relay, you hear it buzz a little bit, all right? So that's, that's what it's doing. On DC, you won't, you won't feel it uh, in your hand, vibrating your hand, so you'll need to rely on the, the gauge there on the front, okay? It checks potential to neutral source just like our, um, just like our uh, voltmeter did, okay? Digital voltmeter. It's a real quick way to find out if you got voltage, just tap, 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 reference into neutral, and it's very quick. It's a little, it's a lot less cumbersome than the voltmeter. I know some of you kind of struggle to hold it still and get your leads up there and all that stuff. So this is a lot quicker and easier. Um, however, it does not give you specific values, and specific values are very important when you really need to know: uh, Am I getting? Have I got a good, an imbalance or something like that in my voltage and how much I'm reading? Okay. So it, it's, it gives you just a general uh, idea of how, how much voltage you've got, okay? But it doesn't give you real, preci real precise values, okay? The other thing that uh, we use in our toolbox there for electrical troubleshooting is the amp clamp, okay? Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna get you to use this as much as possible, as much as I can uh, in the labs. Uh, basically, this is like an inductor. It's like, almost like a little transformer, almost. Uh, you have a current carrying conductor and that you clamp around, which uh, would be three phase, single phase, it doesn't matter. Okay, but you only put one in there. If you try to put two in there, like if like you had two legs, you're three phase, you put uh, two of them in there, you're going to wind up canceling the signal out, and you won't get any reading at all. So uh, this is very simple, very fast uh, tool to use. Um, and as the it's also called an amp clamp, it's called a, an amp meter, an amp probe, uh, it's got a couple different names for it, but it measures current, okay? Now, uh, some of them have the jacks on the bottom here for your leads, so it'll measure uh, current and you can dial it up to the volts over here and measure voltage uh, if you need to, but uh, use these primarily for amp clamps and measures current. Uh, it's non-invasive, and um, I, I think some of you remember when you were in your AIT 1001, 2, 1101 classes, uh, you had to break the meter circuit open and run the circuit through the meter, in the meter, and out of the meter. The meter was in series, okay? And you took a digit, you took a reading on how much current uh, your circuits were were uh, pulling, okay? Uh, that's very impractical in the real world, okay? Uh, because number one, uh, you, the meters have 10 amp fuses in, and you're going to blow fuses immediately. Okay, so it's not practical to use a digital multimeter on the amp scale to measure voltage going, I mean a current going to a three-phase motor. Okay, so you use an amp clamp uh, while, while the motor is running.
okay? I said, again, uh, the thing with this, with the amp, amp clamp is that the equipment must be running, okay? And you can also check and detect whether there are imbalances in the current load uh, being pulled in on any of the conductors. And you can also check for single phasing. We're gonna, come, we're gonna go into single phasing uh, just a little bit later, okay? But you simply, um, you simply take the amp clamp, wrap it around, you clamp it around the conductor while it's running, and it will give you a digital readout of how much current that particular leg is drawing. And again, um, that's also a good way to determine whether the health of your motor. If your motor is pulling more current on one leg, a significant, a significant amount of current uh, on one leg, then you've got some winding problems. Because remember, the current is going to be relative to the uh, resistance. And all of the resistance in the motor should be the same. And remember, if we measured a three -phase, the three-phase induction motor, we took a voltmeter and we measured the resistance of each of the windings, and they were about 13.8 or something like that on a good motor, relatively close. Well, if you've got relatively close resistance values in the stator of your motor, it stands to reason that your current levels should be pulling about the same too, because they're the same and your current levels should be the same. If you've got a leg that's pulling more current than the other uh, there at the motor, chances are you've got winding problems that are starting to show up. So this amp clamp is a wonderful tool to be able to use to find that a, a, an early problem. Uh, it may be giving you some intermittent problems. And so a good way to check the health of the motor without shutting it down, pulling the leads off, putting a meter on, uh, an ohm meter on all of the leads is to quickly, hey, do I even need to do that? And using an amp clamp will tell you, kind of point you in the right direction, okay? So, moving a little forward, uh, just a couple of things mental to, to keep in mind, okay? Be methodical, okay? And be logical. Be focused on what you're doing on as far as reading the schematics and things like that and your approach to this. Um, this is a thing that a lot of people want to do. They want to randomly jump around and guess at what component might be bad. Well, that's a big waste of time. It's really not, it's not really troubleshooting at all. It's just guessing. Uh, I've heard of Easter egging. You know, you're just hunting for the right egg to, to find the egg. Okay, so it's basically guessing and you're just, just randomly checking things, okay? Know what it is that's not working. For example, if a if, um, uh, if control relay is not staying sealed in, well, there's no need to check the push button, okay? And there's no need to check the control relay coil when it's coming in. What the problem is, is your sealing circuit, okay? That's just an example. So don't just arbitrarily run around and just check things for the sake of checking things. Be methodical in your approach. And you'll learn these things as we go through the class. And also as you get some more experience. This right here is one of the hardest things to teach because I'm not sure if it's a left brain or a right brain thing or exactly what it is, but um, it's, it's just difficult, very difficult for some folks. Um, they learn it eventually. Um, sometimes, sometimes they just don't. Uh, but I'm not sure if you're born with it or whatever it is, but uh, it, again, if you, 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 your life will be a whole lot better if you'll take this approach, okay? So let's get into a little bit of, uh, a little bit more details about our uh, motor circuit troubleshooting. We're going to talk about the motor circuit troubleshooting and we're going to talk about the control circuit troubleshooting. We're going to talk a little bit about that transformer that's in between the two as well. Okay, so one of the problems, one of the biggest things that you'll run across in a motor circuit as far as faults are concerned is single phasing. And single phasing is when you have lost, and make sure that you take notes on this stuff, okay. Uh, single phasing is when you have lost one or two of the three phases of incoming power, okay. Single phasing does not mean that you've lost two and you're only running on a single phase. No, single phase phasing means that you've lost one or possibly two phases of your voltage going to your motor, okay? So, for example, uh, so we've got three phase voltage coming in L1, 2, and 3, okay? In this case, we're going to have 208, all right? Somewhere we've got three phase voltage and it's coming in and hopefully we've got three phase voltage being supplied to us, okay? We haven't lost it. Uh, in, out in the utility yard or something like that. We've got three phase voltage and basically we've lost one of these three legs. One of these three legs is not making it to this motor. That's our ultimate goal. We want three phase voltage to be able to pass to our motor. And somewhere between here and our motor, we've lost one of our, one of our phases or possibly two. And we are single phase, okay? So, um, here's the, a, a couple of the uh, characteristics of a single phasing motor. Okay? The rotor will turn very slowly, if at all. 
uh, when, it, <clears throat> when it's coupled to a load. Um, most of the time when it's coupled to a load, uh, it's not going to turn at all. Um, sometimes when it's uncoupled, you might see this in the lab, when you start something up, uh, one of the motors up, and it's single phasing on you, which is a, which is a fault that you're going to encounter in here. When it's single phasing, so, sometimes it might spool up to normal speed, but it has no torque at all. Okay, absolutely no torque. Another characteristic is that it's going to heat up very quickly and the thermal, load, thermal overloads are going to trip. This is particularly the case when the rotor is stalled. Okay, remember I said it had no torque? Well, yeah, that's the case. Uh, you got single phasing, you have a very slow turning rotor. If it's turning at all, it's stalled. So you're not breaking those magnetic lines of flux. That e the counter EMF is not coming down. We got a high current. Our, in other words, our inrush current was very high and it just stays high. Okay, six to eight, maybe 10 times what the full load amperage of that motor should be running at. We have gone way there and we are staying there because we remember as the rotor starts to spin, our current comes down very quickly. Well, when our rotor's not spinning, it just stays high, the current stays high, and that high current is going to trip those overloads out very quickly, okay, as they're supposed to, okay? Um, and let me give you a heads up right here because I have a lot of students that get uh, kind of messed up on this. A bad winding in the motor, in the three-phase motor, is not single phase. Okay, remember what we said about three uh, single phase. That's when we've lost one of the three phases of, motor, of uh, power to the motor. Okay, well we can still supply three phases and have a bad winding. Okay, just because we've got a bad winding doesn't mean one of our phases of power has gone away or two phases have gone away. Okay, so just keep that in mind because I see a lot of students when they got a single phase fault, first thing they'll do is they'll start testing the windings of a motor. That's not, that's not what you're doing. A single phase is when you've lost the power. So you need to be dropping back and finding that power, okay? The loss of that power. The loss of the power is not in the windings, okay? So that's just a little side note for you here. All right, and here's a, here's a two pole, three phase motor. It's just a simple um, uh, illustration of what I was talking about. And again, if we had, this is, uh, this is just one winding that uh, is a coil of wire that wraps around around this pole piece and around this pole piece, a beginning and an end, one wire. Remember, we talked about that a lot last time, okay? Well, if I cut that wire, say, let's say we burn it in two, actually it's burned in two or, or rubbed in two, whatever the case may be, we got, a, we got an open, we got a bad wire and it's open, or it could be shorted, we're gonna get into that too. Um, that means, that, that just means you got a bad winding. L1, two, or three didn't go anywhere. We're still applying voltage, we're applying it to a bad winding, but it's not single facing. So try to keep that in that separated in your mind as you start the troubleshooting process, okay? So again, uh, single facing is loss of that. The other thing I was gonna talk to you about is basically find out which phase is missing uh, with an amp clamp. That's an easy way to do it. Now if you're if you've got a single phasing motor and it's gonna heat up very quickly, you need to be ready with your amp clamp, okay? Perhaps somebody, an operator, again, good relationship with that operator, they'll help you out. If you can have your amp clamp ready and they can start the motor even though it's single phasing, you can very quickly go between L1, L2, and L3 and find out which phase is missing, okay? Because the missing phase won't pull any current. The other two will pull more current than they're supposed to actually, but you'll be able to very quickly clamp around there and find out which one of the three phases is missing because it's not pulling current, okay? So, uh, use that amp clamp and uh, find out which one is, uh, which phase is not reaching the motor, because again, like I said, that's our ultimate goal, all right? And um, here's another thing too, guys. Uh, I see this a lot. Um, you get a single phasing uh, situation, and I don't know if it's inexperience or um, just kind of you know, uh, freaked out by the trainer or what the, whatever the case may be, is a single phasing, you're not gonna find the problem for single phasing in the control circuit, okay? So in other words, I got, I've lost, at one of my phases. Let's just say I lost L1, okay? I'm not going to do anything. There's no component in the um, control circuit that's causing me to lose three phases, okay? One of my three phases, excuse me. So when you have a motor three uh, single phase, don't even worry about the control circuit, okay? Number one, we know that the control circuit's working because it's trying to bring the motor in, all right? It's trying to close these contacts. Now, only one or two of the phases is getting over to the motor, but you know our control circuit's okay. So my point here is that the control circuit has nothing to do with the single phase situation, okay? 
All right, so that's our motor circuit. All right, now we're going to talk a little bit about our control circuit, how we're going to troubleshoot this. And again, this lecture, I can only do so much as far as showing you how to do it. You're going to get your experience on the trainer, uh, Amatrol, and also on the one up front, too. So uh, for our control circuit, okay, use some common sense. Go back to those five senses, okay? Uh, are there lights on? Okay, do you see lights? Okay, do you hear relays clicking and pulling in? Do you hear motor starts? Some of them are really big motor starts, and you'll know when they're coming in. They'll slam and you can hear them. All right, so just use your general con common sense as you approach the control circuit side. Again, we've moved out of the motor circuit. We're now in the control circuit. Okay, and we, as you get a little bit deeper in the control circuit, does the problem affect uh, just one part of the operation, um, or are there multiple parts of the operation that are not working now, okay? Uh, for an example, all right, um, is do the forward and the reverse side of a motor starter, are either one of them coming in, okay? If it'll run in one direction, okay, you can isolate that and, and the forward direction may be just fine, but it won't go in the reverse direction. So then you just start focusing on just the reverse section. Leave everything else alone, okay? Uh, use your print to narrow down what it is that's not working and just forget about the rest of it at that point, okay? At least at that point, all right? Um, the electrical troubleshooting, like I said, find out where the voltage failed to show up, okay, and find out why, all right, and then methodically trace through the circuit with your with your reference to your neutral, okay. So again, I'm not going if my three phase motor is, is running in forward and it's not running in reverse. Well, I'm not. Let's take a look at this right here. All right, look for some things in common. All right. Well, I know it's not my overloads because if it was my overload uh, contacts being tripped, uh, the motor wouldn't run at all, okay? It wouldn't run in forward, which we said it would run in forward in, in this hypothetical situation, okay? Um, I also know it's not going to be this set of contacts right here. Why? Because it's common to both of these two. Uh, if it was this set of contacts right here, um, it wouldn't run in forward. Well, it's running in forward, so we know everything's good through here. and because we know this is good, we know the control relay itself is good. If the contacts are pulling in, we know the coil's good. So why mess with this, okay? That's my point, is try, and you, as Jewel, also, as you uh, become more familiar with equipment there at the place of employment that you're at, you'll stay there and you'll get familiar with it and you'll get faster and you'll kind of learn some of the idiosyncrasies about it too. Uh, but uh, when you first approach it, you know, look, say, hey, my control relay's pulling in, and, or my control relay contacts are closing, that means my control relay has to be pulling in. Why would I go to the e-stop? Why would I go looking for an e-stop? Why would I, why would I uh, take a, a, an ohm meter and try to ohm out a, a switch? You know, use some common sense there, folks. All right? And then so now that you, can, now that you know that this run will work, well, let's dial in on uh, this one. It could be any of these three components right here that are, that are our problem. So that we've really narrowed the field down. So we've been methodical in our approach and we try to find out what's working, what's not, and just focus on that, okay? I want to talk to you now about the types of faults that you'll run into, okay? The first thing we're talking about is opens, okay? That is basically, uh, it could it'd be a couple of different types of opens. Uh, just it, All that is is where there is the path, the path has been broken from uh, the source to our, uh, our load or our control or our, our control device. For example, uh, you can have a fuse, I, and I've, I've altered this drawing a little bit now. Uh, I've got an open right here in this, in this leg right here, okay? I got a bad fuse, okay? So I'm, now I'm gonna have a single phase situation because I've only got one, uh, two legs going, okay? Now, uh, it can also be an open in our, uh, in our overload, again, these two devices are, divide, are designed to allow uh, current to pass through them. If they're not, then we've got an open, okay? If, if, it's, if it's stopping the voltage in its tracks right here, we, can, we call that having an open. And again, terminology is very important, okay? Uh, don't mix up opens with other things that we've been talking about. So get your terminology down, okay? Uh, control relay coils can burn in two, okay? And when they burn in two, when the coil, uh, when the coil, the wire in the coil just burns in two, there's a gap there and the voltage can no longer get into the coil and out of the coil, okay, we call, we call that an open, we can open in our coil. This is a normally closed contacts right here, okay, uh, they could burn open too, they could, they could, uh, part of the contact could burn off, and you've got an open right there when it should be closed, okay. So again, um, 
that's an open, it also got an open in this uh, transformer coil, okay? Um, the voltage in, going into there in our primary side is not coming out, so we do not have a completed circuit, so we're not gonna create that magnetic field. Uh, we're not gonna create that mutual induction. It's not gonna pass the voltage to the secondary coil. So again, either one of the coils could be open, all right? Uh, you guys tested the transformer during the transformer lesson of 1401, so you should be pretty familiar with that. Uh, coils of the motor can burn open, okay? Well, I showed you a picture of that earlier, too. So those are opens. Uh, that's what we call, that's any time that, that the path is no longer complete that allows the, the uh, voltage and current to go to the device, okay? The other type is called a short, okay? You can have a couple of different kinds. You can have shorts in the wiring, okay? In this particular case, here's a good normal current path right here going to the light bulb and returning to the neutral source, all right? This one here is where two conductors uh, got shorted together, the insulation uh, rubbed into for whatever reason, and now uh, voltage is always gonna take the path of least resistance. So what's it gonna do? Our, say, 120 volts is gonna come up here. It's not going to voluntarily go through the resistance of the filament in the light bulb and go out. No, it's gonna take the path of least resistance and it's going to go right here and go straight to neutral, okay? And if you remember Ohm's law, what happens when resistance drops down, Okay, and we have uh, we don't have a, a load in our circuit. You know what happens with our current. Okay, so we got a, we can have a short in our wire. Uh, one other thing I've seen this do in my own personal experience is um, wires that are laying in a trough. Okay, in a wiring trough through vibration and everything, uh, particularly when you go around curves, and, uh, turns in the wiring trough and things like that. You can have uh, insulation break down, and two conductors will come in contact with each other. Now they won't necessarily go to ground, but sometimes I have seen this wire feed another component and make another component work, okay? So uh, it short circuits it and sends it straight to that component in it, you know, a control relay uh, or a uh, hydraulic uh, directional valve, okay? The coil fires on it and next thing you know, I got a valve and I'm pushing a button that should bring in a control relay, but I got a valve actuating over here. That's because the voltage has, uh, on, the, on the conductors carrying the voltage to that component, has rubbed the two and we're now feeding a device that shouldn't be fed. So yeah, you have to, that's, a, that's a, another way that you have a short in there, that's not necessarily a short to ground. Speaking of short to ground, uh, we've talked about that before as well. It bypasses the load altogether. It just goes straight to ground, very high current, trips circuit breaker, blows a fuse. So that's a short to ground, all right? Uh, you have shorts within a component, okay? Um, for example, uh, let's look at our transformer here I've got here to show you, okay? You'll notice that uh, the, the uh, wiring, uh, the transformer wiring, okay, this is again an insulated uh, type, special transformer type of wire, but it's just a coil, a beginning and an end, that's all, okay, and wrapped around the core. All right, but you'll notice that it's layered on top of each other, it's laying on top of each other. And this thing's subjected to a lot of heat, a lot of vibration, and that, vib and that vibration of heat can break the insulation down. So rather than the, um, the voltage going completely into this wire through the coil and coming out this wire, okay, this conductor completing the circuit, what you'll find is sometimes is that the shorted, there'll be a short where it will uh, kind of sh uh, short and bypass a lot of the turns and therefore you're, you're losing a lot of, using, uh, getting a lot less resistance and as a result, your magnetic field is not as strong, so your transformer can short out like that. So that could be a, a, a internal short. Also, um, if you have, um, let's see if I've got, a, got my, let me back up to my schematic here. Also, if you've got a set of contacts right here, they're normally open on the push button, uh, and after a lot of arcing, um, you know, from the current passing through there, they will become welded shut sometimes. Um, on the, on the uh, Amatrol trainer, I had two um, sets of contacts welded shut together, uh, and it would not allow the armature to come back out. It, the, the, the welding of the contacts held the armature in, okay, and the motor would not shut off. So to shut the disconnect off, took it apart, and sure enough, I had contacts that had welded together and stayed stayed closed. There were these contacts right here. They came together. Um, one off one set got welded. They're all three connected, mechanically connected. So when one stayed stuck, they all stayed stuck. So I had actually had two of them uh, last semester that did that. They're both about the same age. So uh, that, those contacts were shorted together. Also, the you know, push buttons and things like that, they can short together as well. 
Anything that's supposed to be normally open that closes as a result of, of, of uh, you know, being actuated or energized, uh, they are susceptible to um, shorts, okay? So, um, going back, okay, shorting in the component, the, the voltage doesn't travel the full length of the coil like I showed you in that transformer, okay? You also don't get this full strength and magnetic field. Let's talk about the three-phase motor for just a second. Um, if you have, all the, <clears throat> these coils uh, theoretically should be all the same resistance value so that your magnetic pull and that rotating magnetic field is even all the way around. So that rotor doesn't have a stronger field than here than it does when it lines up here. They're all the same, okay? However, if you have a shorted coil, it's going to impact the magnetic field. You're not going to have a strong magnetic field, let's say, for example, in the shorted coil on number one here. All right, so it's not going to be a strong magnetic field. Uh, you're going to have some very strange rotor characteristics, some uh, horsepower development problems. You're not going to get the full horsepower. Um, it may not always short enough to blow a fuse, but most, most of the time, if you remember going back to Ohm's Law, if you've got uh, less resistance, your current is going to go up. So you could possibly be blowing fuses at some point as a result. Okay. Uh, let's make sure I've covered everything. Uh, again, um, when the resistance drops, the current goes up, and we start popping breakers and fuses and things like that. So that's, if you've got a breaker or a fuse that you're having to replace or reset, uh, it's telling you something. Okay, if it does it once, you can probably get away with it. Um, if it comes back and hits you again, uh, you know, even three, four, five hours later, you're starting to see problems. You're starting to see degradation. Something's going on. So don't ignore it. Don't reset it. Don't put bigger fuses in it. Uh, you know, oh gosh, please don't do that. All right. So anyway, um, and then finally, uh, like I said, normally open uh, components become welded closed, uh, and they do not allow the circuit to open up as they should. Okay. Uh, as an example, we're looking here. Uh, I told you about the control relay. I mean, the uh, motor starter uh, contacts closing on me. Uh, on two of the ones over there on the Amatrol trainer. Um, I push a button that should be open. When I push it, it accidentally weld, it welds closed. And when I release the operator, uh, the contacts stay closed and it continues to run regardless of a sealing circuit, even if it didn't have one. Okay? Control relay contacts uh, will often weld together just like a push button, you know, just like the motor starter contacts. Control relay contacts weld together as well. Okay? Um, but uh, that's basically the things that you're going to encounter when you're troubleshooting. Um, you're going to count them in the, in the lab because you're going to have uh, the computer's going to set all of those faults for you uh, when you are building the circuit. As, after you build the circuit, the computer will set the faults. You'll find them uh, and you'll get more uh, comfortable with it. What I'm not going to allow to happen is you get real comfortable on that trainer. That's uh, that's not teaching you anything. All you're doing is learning the trainer, and that's not what we want to do. We want to be able to really effectively go out and do some real-world troubleshooting. Um, so, anyway, uh, you'll get experience with all that. Um, that's it for troubleshooting. Um, it's about the most I can bring to you. The rest of it you're going to need to pick up in the lab. I've got some pre-lab material that I need you to read prior to coming to lab, okay? Uh, make sure you take care of that. Take care of your business on that stuff, okay? Um, and other than that, we'll see you in the lab. If you've got any questions, come find me and give me a shout. We'll figure out what it is, okay? Other than that, thanks a lot, and we'll see you in the lab.